Happy Spooktober, everyone. Tis the season of tricks and treats, and I have here for you a diabolical horror. Imagine this. It's Halloween night. You're waiting patiently at the door for the neighborhood trick-or-treaters to come so you can hand them out various editions of the sweetest book, Stuart's Calculus. You even have a precious first edition to hand out to the best costume of the night. Then, suddenly, three trick-or-treaters show up to your house and you can't believe your eyes. They're not dressed as Michael Myers, wizards, or even Superman. But instead, they're dressed as mathematicians, Emmy Nother, Leonard Euler, and Paul Erdish. This is the new Halloween design available exclusively at Mathshin.com, my math fashion brand. Cozy, oversized sweaters, hoodies, t-shirts, and mugs, we have it all. This awesome, spooky design will be available through December 31st of this year, only at Mathshin.com. Link in the description and the pinned comment. Now, I want to tell you about the characters and the mathematical references featured in our awesome Halloween design. Let's go left to right, starting with this adorable chap who's dressed up as the inimitable Paul Erdish. Born March 26th, 1913, Erdish was a quirky and utterly prolific fella, with a coffee addiction perhaps only rivaled by his single-minded pursuit of mathematics at all times and in all places. One of Erdish's most distinctive talents was his ability for posing problems, especially the the right problem for the right person. Not too hard and not too easy. Some of his problems he posed and offered bounties for their correct solution. Andre Zamoretti, for example, won a cool thousand dollars for proving a fascinating conjecture about arithmetic progressions from Erdish and his collaborator Paul Turin. Let me tell you what this one among many conjectures from Paul Erdish was all about. An arithmetic progression is a sequence of numbers with a constant difference. For example, 2, 5, 8, 11 is a four-term arithmetic progression with a constant difference of 3. Or 11, 21, 31, 41, 51, 61. This is a six-term arithmetic progression. Now, the conjecture said that every set of natural numbers a with positive natural density contains a k term arithmetic progression for every k. The natural numbers are the positive integers, and the natural density of a set of natural numbers a is the limit of the proportion of natural numbers that are in a where that proportion is taken over the first n natural numbers, and we let n go to infinity. By definition, then, if the set A has natural density equal to alpha, then alpha is either zero or it is positive. And Andre Zamoretti proved Erdish's conjecture that indeed, if alpha is positive, then A contains a k-term arithmetic progression for every K. And for his trouble, Zamoretti earned Erdish's $1,000 bounty and got a theorem adorned with his name. When a little kid arrives at your house dressed up as Paul Erdish, he might not open up his candy pail or pillowcase, probably too busy sipping coffee. But rest assured, his brain is open, and if you want to talk math, he'll happily take up residence in your home for a weekend. Though you shouldn't let him, so you don't receive charges for kidnapping. Now, this fella here is wearing one heck of a costume. He's dressed up as Leonard Euler. When you consider some of the greatest mathematicians of all time, Leonard Euler is right up there. Born in 1707, the Swiss phenom, the master of us all, Euler was immortalized in this iconic portrait by Jacob Emanuel Handman, where you can see a slight squint, as in 1738, Euler became blind in his right eye. Now, it would be hopeless to attempt any summary of the mathematics of Euler, but this little boy hasn't just dressed up as Euler. He has also picked his candy pail accordingly. This is a regular dodecahedron. It's a solid with 12 pentagonal faces. Of course, to serve its purpose in harvesting candy, the top face has been removed. You can make your own dodecahedron at home by carefully folding together what we call a net 
of the dodecahedron. And here are a few questions we can ask about the structure of this shape. How many vertices, edges, and faces does it have? Starting with vertices, which are the points where three pentagonal faces meet, we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. So twenty vertices. There are a lot of edges. So let's just do the faces next. Of course, we already know there are twelve faces. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So twenty vertices, twelve faces. We could proceed to count all of the edges, but in fact, with the information we have now, we can already determine the number of edges thanks to old Leonard Euler and what's known as Euler's formula, which states that in a convex polyhedron, the number of vertices plus the number of faces. Minus the number of edges must equal two. Hence, for our dodecahedron, we have that twenty plus twelve minus the number of edges must equal two. So, solving for e, the number of edges must in fact be thirty. An actual count would confirm this, but it's nice to not have to do it. How creative of this young lad to bring a dodecahedron candy pail with him trick or treating! It almost makes me want to buy another T-shirt with this awesome design in a different color. Good thing they're only twenty-three bucks and ship internationally. These spooky Halloween T-shirts are made with a thicker fabric than the other T-shirts at Matchin.com. This is one hundred percent ring-spun cotton. And then we have this little girl who's dressed up. Up as the legendary German mathematician Emmy Noether. At 18 years old, Noether was certified to teach language in schools for girls, but she had other dreams, and instead she went to study mathematics at the University of Erlangen, where her father Max was a professor of what else? Mathematics. Unfortunately, at the time, women were not especially welcome in academia and could only audit classes with the professor's explicit permission. A few years later, in the winter of 1903 to 04, Noether audited classes at the famed University of Göttingen, and among the professors she audited was the incredibly influential mathematician David Hilbert. She then returned to the University of Erlangen, where she was now allowed to. Be a full student, and she received her PhD in 1907. Then, in 1915, at the insistence of David Hilber and Felix Klein, Emmy Noether went to work and research once more at the University of Göttingen. She did lecture, but for several years she was only allowed to do so under Hilbert's name, and much of the faculty there objected to her holding a position at the university. Now, this little trick or treater knows her math. History. David Hilbert was perhaps Emmy Noether's biggest advocate. So to collect candy in her Emmy Noether costume, she's taken along David Hilbert's hat. As with all great mathematicians, it's difficult to pick one piece of Emmy Noether's accomplishments to give you a taste of her maths. But for Noether, let us briefly discuss what are called Noetherian rings, which are rings satisfying a special condition Noether studied. A ring is an algebra. Algebraic structure. It's a set of elements that obey certain properties under two operations called addition and multiplication. A warm and familiar example is the ring of integers. The elements of this ring are the integers, which are the numbers with no fractional part. And these integers form a ring with our familiar operations because the addition of integers. And the multiplication of integers are both associative. There is an additive and a multiplicative identity, a number which can be added to anything or multiplied by anything without changing it. Multiplication distributes over addition, the familiar distributive property. And addition has two other requirements for this to be a ring. Firstly, is the commutative property. The order of addition doesn't matter. And there are additive inverses. Every number has a negative. That can be added to it to produce the additive identity zero. Because of these extra properties that addition has, if we just ignore 
the multiplication, the integers form what's called an additive group. The group here, of course, being the integers with the operation of addition. They satisfy all these key properties we just listed, and we might call it the rings additive group. You remove multiplication, and what remains is a group with addition. So what is a Noetherian ring? It's simple, a ring that satisfies the ascending chain condition. For simplicity, let us only consider what are called commutative rings, rings where the order of multiplication doesn't matter. If you think multiplication never matters, you'll just have to take my word for it that there are exotic rings with objects and operations called multiplication where order absolutely matters. Now, the ascending chain condition concerns something that's called an ideal. An ideal I of a ring R is a subgroup of the ring's additive group that absorbs multiplication. Now, absorbing multiplication means you could take any element from the ring, let's call that element little r, and any element, let's say, x from the ideal, and then the product r times x is going to be an element of the ideal. Since we're assuming the ring is commutative, x times r, of course, would also be in the ideal. So even though the ideal might not have every single element that's in the ring, you can get out of the ideal by multiplying its elements by any ring elements. You take an element from the ideal, multiply by something from the ring, you're going to be stuck in the ideal. The ideal absorbs the multiplication. A typical example of an ideal can be seen, again, with our familiar ring of integers. One example of an ideal is the subring of even integers, which is often written like this. This, of course, contains all the multiples of two. Every element from this ideal is, of course, course, by definition, even. There are certainly some numbers in the ring that aren't in the ideal, like all the odd numbers, 3, 5, 1, 7, etc. But if you take any of those odd numbers, like 5, for example, and multiply it by any element of this ideal of even integers, you are, of course, going to get another even integer, because it's still going to be a multiple of 2. Thus, you remain within the ideal. We could look at multiples of 8 for another simple example of an ideal. In fact, this ideal that contains the multiples of 8 is entirely contained within the ideal that contains the multiples of 4. And of course, this ideal containing the multiples of 4 is entirely contained in that first ideal we mentioned that consists of the even integers. Now, for a ring to satisfy the ascending chain condition means that it has no infinite increasing chain of ideals. That is, whenever i1 is a subset of i2 is a subset of i3 and so on is an increasing chain of ideals, there's some positive integer m such that ik equals im for all k at least m. This just means that if you can write out an infinite chain of ideals, it's not actually infinite. There must be some final ideal and there are no more unique ideals after that. So it's not really an infinite chain. You could just stop at that final unique ideal and you'd have a finite chain. In other words, the ideals don't just keep getting bigger and bigger. The chain we were looking at here could of course go one step further since every ring is an ideal of itself and the even integers are indeed a subset of the integers. But that would be it. And indeed, the ring of integers does satisfy the ascending chain condition. And thus, this is a classic example of a Noetherian ring. A non-example would be the ring of continuous functions. In this ring, the objects aren't numbers, but continuous functions from the reals to the reals. The operations are not the addition and multiplication of numbers, but the typical function addition and function multiplication operations. Since this ring is not not Noetherian, it must be that it fails to satisfy the ascending chain condition. Hence, in the ring of continuous functions, there is actually an infinite increasing chain of ideals. And it's a pretty cute one that's easy to define. Let i n be the ideal of all continuous functions that map x to zero whenever x is at least n. Then as we let n range from one up to infinity, we get an infinite increasing chain of ideals. We could of course take any continuous function from the whole ring 
and multiply it by an element of one of these ideals, and because of how they're defined, the product is going to consist entirely of zeros for all inputs that exceed a certain n, and thus the product will certainly be a member of the ideal that we took from. And notice that this chain of ideals is increasing, because as n increases, the restriction becomes weaker. The ideal i1 is only going to contain the continuous functions that map x to zero for every single input that's at least one. But all of the functions in i3, for example, only need to map x to zero when x is at least three. Hence, all the functions in i1 would certainly also belong to i3. So the ring of continuous functions is another pretty simple ring, but this one is not Noetherian. So that's a quick look at Noetherian rings, named after the brilliant mathematician this girl is dressed up as, Emmy Noether. Again, I hope you love the design as much as I do. I worked with an artist to really get this just right, and I love what he did. Link in the description and the pinned comment, mathchen.com. You can get it on a hoodie, t-shirt, sweaters, mugs, whatever you like. It's available through the end of this year, so pick it up if you like it, and happy Halloween. I think this will be the perfect design to wear to any spooky math tests you have coming up this month. And as always, be sure to subscribe for more of the the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm unstable, I'm feeling art to keep the cable cut and unsort the table. If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal. I wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm jaded. Hate the odds that I calculated. Press and pull my brain and push it all the way through the whole blue planet. Faded. Psychosomatic habits, why you so so.